This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network, SNN Inc., and the Planet Microcap Podcast and the representatives are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy and sell securities at any company mentioned and make profit in the event those securities rise in value. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast. Welcome to the Planet Microcap Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and thank you all so much for your support and for tuning in. You can follow Planet Microcap on Twitter at Bobby K. Kraft. That's B-O-B-B-Y-K-K-R-E-F-T. You're listening to episode 185. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to tweet at me or shoot me an email at rcraft at snnwire.com. And when you do get a chance, if you like what you hear, please rate and review Planet Microcap on iTunes. It really helps provide feedback for me and spread the microcap message. We are about three weeks away from the SNN Network Summer Virtual Event taking place on August 17th through 19th, 2021. Presenting companies, speakers, and sponsors are up on the website now, featuring the likes of Guy Spear, Caitlin Cook, Ben Claremont, Mark Jones, and so many more. Uh, You'll have to go on the website and check it out. It's live. The full details of the event are at conference. Dot SNN dot network. That's the website, conference.snn.network. Registration is open, so if you'd like to participate, click the register button once you're there. That gives you access to engage with all of the content that will be going on during those three days, as well as do one-on-one meetings with all of our presenting companies if, you, if you'd like. Uh, so again, SNN Network Summer Virtual Event happening August 17th through 19, 2021. Our website is conference.snn.network. I'll see you all there. Speaking of doing one-on-ones with management teams and and why that's so important, for this episode of the Planet Microcap podcast, I spoke with Chris Crew. He is the president of Chatham Harbor Capital Management. Now, I've known Chris for years, and while we miss seeing each other at investor conferences around the country, we'll settle for a fun chat via Zoom uh, on, on this podcast. We continue the conversation that we started on an episode of the Investors Roundtable that was titled uh, Microcap Due Diligence in the Virtual World. Chris is all about meeting management, probably the most gung-ho investor I've ever met about meeting management, and we discussed why it helped him become the investor that he is today. So thank you again for tuning into episode 185 of the Planet Microcap podcast, and please enjoy my conversation with Chris Krupp. Welcome back, everybody, to the Planet Microcap Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft. And joining me today is a good friend of mine. I've known him for years now. Um, I mean, we just we just miss seeing each other at, at, at these in-person conferences because we always see each other there. And, and on top of which, we just did a great roundtable talking about, you know, what it's like to interview management. We're, we're going to cover so many topics today having to do specifically with, uh, you know, what, what got me here with microcaps. So uh, with that, I'm really excited to, to uh, introduce today Chris Krug. He's the president of Chatham Arbor Capital. Chris, good to see you, brother. How are you doing? Thanks for having me, Bobby. I appreciate it. It's great to have you. So uh, look, I, not only you're a friend of mine, but you know, I know you, you have a lot of friends in the microcap space. So they know you. They, they know they, they've seen you do work. They've seen you at all these events. But you know, I thought it was time to have you on here to you know, get a little bit about your background and you know, share with, you, with our audience some of your experiences speaking with management, some stories and some ideas and, 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 and really go run the gamut. So you know, I'd love to start off with where your passion for investing began, and then we'll, and then we'll go from there. Yeah. So early in my career, I, uh, I got out of college. I actually went to Clemson University in South Carolina. In my fourth year in Clemson, I took my first finance course. And then I was about to graduate. And then I decided I liked finance. So I spent, uh, I think I took 67 hours in one year. So I was taking 10 or 11 classes per semester to get a, uh, to get a uh, degree in finance my, final, my fifth year in college. Then I moved up uh, to New York. And I worked for this small brokerage shop where I worked on a small cap training desk. And the guys were doing a bunch of different things. They were doing uh, sort of 
mostly in the small cap arena. Some were doing some merger R, but it, they, they were they were making a lot of money. Basically, uh, what's a, what's a good way of explaining it? They, they didn't really care as much about the fundamentals, but they were more about the technicals of of the actual market. Where I was always more of a Graham McDodd value guy. So so I sat there and I I. I would get in early. I would get in at 4 a.m. every morning. And I, I, my goal was to read a book a day for two years. And I did. And uh, on average, on average. How, how do you read that? Do you, can you read that fast? <laughs> yeah. I mean, a lot of them were stories. So I found this syllabus by, um, and I suggest everyone doing this. Uh, Jim Chanos teaches a class at Yale about the history of financial fraud. And he has a syllabus. You can, you can search for it on Google. It's 54 pages. And it has, I don't know. Uh, it must have 500 books on it of everything you need to know about my financial market history. So I, I, I downloaded that. I, I spent it one day. My, my dad went to Columbia, and which is a better school than Clemson. So I figured that if I downloaded all the syllabuses from Columbia, Harvard, Pr- uh, Princeton, Penn- University of Pennsylvania, Yale, I, I would find some good books to read. So I found that. And then I spent $30,000 on books my first year in the city. And, uh, yeah, and, uh, and I read through every single one of them. So fundamental analysis, technical analysis, quantitative analysis, everything across the board, how money flow works, everything. So I, I think that was base. Yeah. That, that, that takes effort, dude. Yeah. <laughs> 30K on books. Wow. Yeah. It was Holy a lot of money. It was a lot Holy of money. Holy crap. Where's your bookshelf? Come on, man. Like I, you know, I got- <laughs> it's in my bedroom actually, but I don't want to show you. There's, there's too many. It almost looks messy. I, I used to have, I used to have seven bookshelves in my apartment, but it, t- it took up the entire apartment. I, I'm talking about like six foot tall and like three feet wide. I mean, and then we have a house in Maine. I brought all of them, or most of them up there. Now I just keep the financial history ones. I was going to say, like, I, I didn't even know there was $30,000 worth of finance books out there. I guess there well, are. I, I mean, I was buying books from the 1920s that were out of print. Everything was on AB books. Uh, these, weren't, these weren't new books. These were just random books about what different investment philosophies were at different points in time. What was the coolest one you found from the 1920s? Jeez. Uh, from that, I mean, they, I mean, there, there are a lot of good books about the 1920s. Like, oh, one, okay. Honda is very good. Uh, Which one? Sorry, I, 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 cut, I cut that off. It's called Once in Golconda. Okay. It, uh, it's by um, whatever his name is, John Brooks. I, I figured out he existed because Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, I think it was Bill Gates that said that his favorite book of all time was Business Adventures by John Brooks. But John Brooks is a, actually a fantastic author. He, he has, I don't know, 20 books on market history, but it's, it's basically stories about different points in time. And he, he started writing, I think, in the 40s. And this one was talking about uh, Richard Whitney and sort of the scandal that happened with uh, in the 1920s, more or less, and the fraud that was going on. So it was, wow. it was interesting. I'm a, I'm a little, th- I mean, this was like five or six years ago, seven years ago. So I'm a little bit rusty on a little bit of stuff, but Bro, uh, you, I, I, I think I, you I, should, you, really well. you, you need to go on Jamie Catherwood's podcast and talk about financial <laughs> history with him. I mean, just, what are we talking to me for right now? Like, I mean, what, what are we doing here? Yeah. Well, that's, basically, that, that's basically how I learned investing, right? I, I learned about it when I was 21, where I bet you a lot of the uh, people that listen to your podcast are in simple situations. And then sort of through brute force, I got a job and I just forced myself. I worked, I don't know, 16 hours a day, seven days a week, just read and read and worked and, and understood and tried to understand how the markets worked. And then after two years, I, I took about a year to sort of develop my strategy from what I was, was doing. Then I started my farm. Gotcha. All right. So uh, tell us a little bit about your strategy. You know, what, what is it, you know, how, how does it work? What's your style? And, you know, I mean, look, you're one of the most well-read people I've had on here. Okay. You know, let, 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 yeah, I'm so curious how you, how you, what, how'd you formulated what you're doing today? So I, I, I'm sure it's has changed even. Since. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely changed over time, but, but sort of what, what I do is I try to talk to, 50 to 75 management teams a week. So I'm trying to follow thousands of situations at all times. And I'm basically looking for management to tell me certain things, right? I mean, it's, it's really easy. I ask the same questions over and over again to every single management team. I try to talk to them once every six months, just see what's changed. And you sort of figure out which situations are there out there that you can make money in. I mean, a lot of people focus on compounders or I guess you're not supposed to say that. So compounders or whatever it's called, uh, or people look at value or they look at growth or whatever. 
I'm just trying to look for things that I think can go up 10 X in three years. So obviously I could be wrong about things, but what, there's a plausible path, not, not like I, I'm, I'm talking about a good business that can go up. And that tends to be in situations where there's a lot of leverage and, and that's where our sort of bread and butter is that we find these things that are trading at less than three times pre-tax free cash flow on the equity stuff. And it doesn't have to be this year. If it's growing really quickly, I can, if I could model it out. So in a couple of years, it's less than three times and it's growing so fast that it gets there. Then I like that as well. Cause I can, I can still make a lot of money on that. Um, but, but I, I, I try to look for it pretty much in every industry. Um, I mean, a lot of people say like a, a, a pharmaceutical company could go up 10x. Well, that's not something that I'm particularly interested in, but I, I would look at a pharmaceutical company that has an FDA, uh, a, a drug approved and they're starting to roll it out and people think that they have to raise money, but management's screaming at me that they don't have to raise money. And then I do my work and that sort of gives me the first sort of idea of what kind of situation I'm looking at. That people, most of the companies we invest in, people absolutely hate. For some reason, they've missed expectations in the past. They have a ton of debt. Coronavirus crushed them for some reason. It's an industry that people hate. Just across the board, so everyone hates it for some reason. And a lot of my background is due to is more or less economics from being a trader for a couple of years, right? That what makes stocks go up is supply and demand. Obviously, fundamentals are the most important thing. Well, in the long run, right? But in the short run, the best situations tend to happen when no one knows about a particular stock and then you create the demand for that particular com company. So you have, you have a situation where no one will touch it, right? It has to be in a good, in well, it doesn't have to be in a good industry, but there has to be some portion of the business that's actually growing. So like a lot of companies, a lot of people screen for things that have revenue growing and that are trading at a low multiple to price of sales. I screen for things. I, I just try to look at everything that has revenue declining that's trending at uh, one time or one to three times EBITDA or something like that. So, so it looks, it appears that something's going wrong, but I'm looking for some portion of the business. Usually when companies are dying, they try to pivot. It happens a lot in VC as well. They try to pivot into some kind of other business. And that's generally where you make a lot of money. You find these things that appear on a screen that it's a piece of shit. And then, but in reality, they have this really good portion of the business that's growing really quickly that people are going to forget about the shitty business and they're going to look at the good business, but you have to buy it at the right price. People mess up with the strategy because they buy things at seven times EBITDA. You got to buy things at two or one times EBITDA on, on the equity stub. And then, and then people are obsessed with uh, having good management teams. Well, do you know what the best type of management team is? A management team that has to make one that that has a ton of leverage and they have to pay down their debt or they're gonna go bankrupt and they can't do anything stupid. So, I mean, that's why I like deleveraging situations because it, it's management has to pay down their debt, then the equity is gonna become a larger portion of the enterprise value. People are gonna start looking at the growth portion of the business, not the declining portion of the business. And I bought it at two times free cash flow, and it should be trading if if the top line's growing, gonna be growing in three years at 50%, it should be trading at 20 times free cash flow. That's the making of something that we look for. So it's hard to find these because you have to, you have to talk to management constantly and you have to figure out where their head's at, what's actually a good business, what is, what is going to actually drag a company under, is, or, or where their head is at in general. But, mm -hmm. but that's, that's sort of the process that, you, that I have to talk to 50 to 75 companies a week to really do this. All right, so we're going to go down that rabbit hole because uh, look, you go uh, as I said at the opening. I see it all these conferences. You know, you participate in our conferences, and you do a ton of meetings. You know, so why why would is that the first part? Usually, everybody does all the quantitative stuff first. They do their screens, they have their companies. Okay, I'm going to go talk to her, 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 her. you know. But you're you're kind of the opposite. You're like, I want to talk to fifty to seventy of these guys or these people first, and then. I'll do, I'll do the deeper dive after I had a conversation, you know? So how did you arrive at that process? Yeah, and, and I, I approach this a different way. Um, and uh, the, the guy who actually taught me how to do this was Brian Weber. He, we, we were on another uh, a, a podcast together. Um, and Brian does the same sort of strategy that I do. We, we look for a little bit different things, but, but same kind of ideas. But the reason why I talk, and I, I especially, I, I go into a lot of meetings when I've never met a company before, almost blind. I mean, obviously, I know a lot about a lot of different industries, but but I want to hear what management has to say. A lot of people in this industry are really smart, 
like really, really smart. And they're almost too smart for their own good in, in the sense that you go into a meeting and you're asking such good questions. You're not letting management tell you what they want to hear, what, what you want to, what, what they want to tell you. They might be super excited about something, but your, your questions are so good. You get into this long discussion with them about one minute portion of the business. I want to hear what these people have to say. And I literally look at the numbers first. I don't care what the business even does. I mean, obviously, I'm not going to invest in a horrible business, but but in general, I always start with the numbers, and I think that's the most important aspect of of at least my strategy. Not that it's the right strategy, but it works for me. Right. When, when you're talking to them, that's what you mean. You know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I want to them first, and, and the first couple of questions are like, all right, well, tell me the numbers. Like, what are, what's going on? Right, right. So, so they 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 pitch it to me. I understand. I, I try to make sure when I get on a call, I try to make sure what try to figure out what this company does. What are the portions of the business? What do they do? A lot of it, I just let management just tell me, right? I let them go through the deck and then I ask questions along the way. Then I have to figure out exactly what numbers are now. Then I figure out what numbers are in three years. So I try to figure out how fast revenue can grow. Okay. Just basic. How fast can revenue grow? And what's sort of the certainty that the revenue can grow fast? Okay. If you're buying something at 20 times EBITDA, then you getting that perfectly correct really matters. When I'm buying something at two times EBITDA, I just have to be generally right, right? Mm -hmm. Then I have to figure out what EBITDA margins are now, right? And then what can they be in the future? Are they 20% now and they could be 40% in the future? Well, that's a big deal. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to me if it's I'm off by 5%, but I have to be generally right, right? So if I'm buying something at two times EBITDA now and they can double their EBITDA margins and grow by 50% a year as they deleverage. And then I have to figure out sort of how free cash flow works and what's CapEx, what's maintenance CapEx now, what is in the future, what's cash interest. I like, I like buying companies with a lot of debt because free cash flow will grow over the years because right. you're paying down cash interest decreases and it grows. So it's, it's an easy way to see the progress with the business, but you have to make sure the company's not going to go bankrupt. Right, right. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> yeah. Easier said than done in some cases, right? Right. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, but I wanted to uh, another, keep going down the rabbit hole when it comes to when you're, you know, you're talking to a company, you, you made the point here about, you know, if it's 20x EBITDA, you want to make sure that your, your predictions are perfect. You know, but yeah. if 2x, 2x EBITDA, if it's trading at that, you know, you can be generally right. You know, when you're in the process of doing the interview, you know, what are some of the things when you're hearing what management has to say gives you the indication of like, okay, I can reasonably predict that revenues are going to be, you know, three X revenues in, you know, a year or two or three, you know, like yeah. what, what are some of the things that, that management has said to you that makes you think that? I mean, it, it really depends, right? Like obviously the easiest type of revenue growth is if something's contractual. So if you know, if you know that they just initiated, they just got a new contract and the revenues are going to show up two years from now, and then it's going to be for another eight, eight years. Okay. That's the best kind of situation that you, they don't have to do anything. A lot of people mess up because they listen to what management's saying and management's not sure if they're going to win these, these contracts. They're not going to win it. What you want to do, and, and this, it's, it's really hard to find companies that are really, really good, like really good setups where the downside risk is very minimal. But sometimes that, sometimes that I, I don't really care that much about insider ownership or who owns a stock. I mean, I have my own process. I don't really care what anyone else is doing for the most part. I don't follow other investors. I mean, like a lot of my friends give me my ideas and don't get me wrong. That's not what I meant. But, but I, don't, I don't follow like the big funds or anything like that or, or like try to cut, mimic their types of businesses or anything. I just sort of have my own process. Insider ownership, I, I don't think it really matters. I think a lot of CEOs, I mean, there's a lot of insider ownership with a lot of tech companies that the, there's a, it's a founder run tech company. And that's just because, the, the nature of how that works. There are a lot of very well-run businesses where the insider owns one or 2% of the business. And it's not because they, um, they, uh, they, they're, they don't believe in the business because they don't have any money. Like a lot of, a lot of CEOs of smaller uh, under $500 million market caps make like $300,000 a year. So, so I, I, I just, yeah. So I, I don't know if that really answered your question, but, but th those are sort of the, the, the I, I don't care as much about the things that a lot of other people care about. I care literally about like how, so, so on the revenue side, like how predictable the revenues are in terms of, like I said, the, the contractual aspect of it, but also it's just, you can sort of, sort of, I, I listen a lot to management as well. 
in the beginning, if, if they're telling me there's no doubt in their mind, they're going to be able to grow by 50% a year. Do you know what that tells me? I need to start doing a lot more work on it because if, if someone's telling me, Oh, well, I can only grow at 5% a year and it's trading at 10 times deeper, then just pass. It's just, it's not worth my time. You know, oh, what I mean? there's, there's actually a micro cap that, that has said that to you. Cause that's no, 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 just in general. That's very, I, I know, I, I know you're saying in general, but that'd be, that'd be yeah. kind of funny. <laughs> but I'm just looking for ideas that potentially could work. <laughs> right. So of course. I, I go through 50 or 75 companies, 10 of them are, are opportunities that could work. I'm not saying they're going to work, but there are opportunities. I have to start having follow-up calls with them and start doing expert calls and stuff like that. Right. Right. And then you whittle it down and you might find one idea out of every 300, 400 that is really top notch could really, really work. Most of the time I have 50 ideas, hundred ideas that I'm watching that if it goes down by 50%, I want to buy it. Right. But right. In, in reality, there are only so many at that point in time, which I think are really, really good ideas. You know, you brought up a good point about the when when you're wanting to predict revenue. And I've come across this so many with so many companies where like that microcap will announce, we just got we were just awarded a $50 million contract from this. And like you read the press release, you see that you're like, wow, this is that's a huge deal for this. Steve, it, they they might be a market cap that's less than 50 million. And they announced a $50 million contract, but then, you know, and maybe the stock pops or whatever, but then you look at the details and you're like, okay, it's not fully recognized right away. It's maybe over right. five years, you know, like, have you come across those situations where you're like, Oh yeah, of course, of course. It's that just happens it's so terrible. often. Yeah. But, but I don't like screen for those type of situations. Those, right. because most of the time, if they come out with a big contract, people realize it. And it's already trading at like, I, I'm literally, I'm looking for valuation first. Is this company cheap now or next year or the following year? And then if it is, then what is my expected revenues over the course of those, that time? And how can EBITDA margins sort of change over time? So I, I just, it, 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 and then there are a hundred different varieties of interesting situations that could possibly occur. Sure. Like where a lot of people look at, like from that angle where you might look for, Oh, a big contract, you might buy it for a big contract. I'm just literally looking for something trading at less than three times pre-tax free cash flow, either this year or a couple of years out and then go right. from there. Because do you know, what? as long as the company doesn't go bankrupt, it's all soft catalysts. You don't need any big wins. You don't need anything. And I, I'm not going to lose money. That's the key. If you can't, if you don't lose money, you don't do anything really stupid then you can make a lot of money over time. Very good. All right. Well, you know, I, I can already hear the audience just like screaming in my ear. Like, can you please ask Chris for some anecdotes of like some, some, you know, when you've talked to hundreds and th of thousands of CEOs at these events and doing all this, and then some of the follow-up from that, you know, you must have a ton of stories. So, you know, tell us what's, what's some of your best anecdotes from, you know, speaking with management and then it resulting in maybe either one of your best ideas or maybe a learning experience. So I'd love, love to hear. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll show you two different stories that are, I'll share two different stories that are actually kind of related. And one of the companies I haven't spoken with management, but I, I've been doing work on the company because it's related to the other company. So uh, I'll tell you my best idea right now. And just so everyone knows, I'm a big bull on this one and I own it. And don't take uh, my word for anything and don't buy it. Uh, do your own research. But it's not financial advice. <laughs> this is not financial advice at all. So, but, uh, but it's, a good, it's a good indicator of a perfect scenario for us. And I think it's the biggest no-brainer I've ever seen in my life. But don't buy it. Um, uh, <laughs> um, so there's this company called Performant Financial. So PFMT is the ticker. So situation was the company went public in 2012 as a student loans collections company. And as we all know, with the new administration and with coronavirus, that industry got absolutely decimated. Since the middle of uh, last summer, uh, I, I don't even think you have to pay your student loans anymore. Actually, you don't have to pay your student loans anymore and that, that they're on, your payments are on hold. So their revenues went down by 39% last year. And, uh, they went down by, uh, they were expected to go down by 45 or 55% on that portion of the business. Also in 2012, they bought this company called Hops, which is run by this guy named Simeon Keel, and it's a healthcare company. And what they do is they audit insurance claims, and they also determine the eligibility of, of a payment for uh, like which insurance company should pay for a particular claim. Okay. So this company went public at something like a $2 billion valuation, big valuation. And this it went public at 
$15. And when I found it, I found it actually at the Lithium conference and they just, one of the conferences I go to and uh, it, it was at 60 cents. So $15 in 2012, 60 cents. Now it was a $25 million market cap. And the reason why I even pay attention to it, because obviously everyone in the world knows that student loans were not in good shape at all. And they were declining. It was a mess, but they had the, the, this, this healthcare portion of the business was uh, in 2014 at $3.4 million in revenue. And they were, it looked like they were going to do 60 plus in 2020, pretty good growth. And actually this year they're expected to do 86.5% uh, or 86.5 million dollar midpoint. But I didn't know what the hell the insur healthcare insurance company was, uh, the, the claims company. I, I just didn't understand it at all. And, but the company looked like it was going to do $20 million in EBITDA. They had $60 million in net debt, but the, the CEO was saying, this is not an issue. This is not an issue. We're going to be able to pay it off. We're generating enough free cash flow. It's not an issue. Okay. So you had a situation where the enterprise value was 80 million bucks. So four times EBITDA, EBITDA uh, for that year. I don't really look at enterprise value too much. Uh, I, I prefer just looking at the market cap. Obviously, you have to be able to pay off the debt. But I think if you, if you look at it as four times instead of one times, and a lot of my friends disagree with me on this one, but I like just looking at the equity stuff because the equity, if you're going to pay off all the debt over time, the equity is the only portion that's important. Um, but so it was trading four times EBITDA, EBITDA, the equity stuff was trading at one times. Um, and then in the course of a week before I could even do any work on it, it went to $3. So 60 cents, $3, forgot about it. Uh, then in January, I got a call from one of my friends, Harris Perlman. Uh, he's Otter Market on Twitter. Uh, I'm sure you know Harris. Uh, and he was like, did you see this Performant Financial? And I was like, yeah, I, I know that company. I, I wanted to buy it. And then it ran against me. Uh, and he, he was like, I'm looking at it. It was at 85 cents at that point. And then I just started doing, I started doing work on it. And it was, it was really cheap. It was trading at 1.5 times uh, EBITDA or, well, on the equity stub. It, 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 the market was 35 million bucks at that point. Then um, uh, yeah, I, I bought it and I started doing work. But I didn't know what the hell the healthcare business was. And that's how a lot of the situations occur for me. It, it takes a long time to do work on these companies, but I usually buy things before I'm particularly ready. Not, not an entire position, but I buy things over time, but I buy, I, I buy a start position, two, 3% something like that. When, when I, when I have really good confidence and I've talked to management multiple times that, that I, I'm not going to, not going to really get burned on it. And there's a potential that I can make 10 times the money. So I ended up having a call with management once a week for two, three months. And then uh, I told a couple of my other friends about it. A couple of them had heard of it before. So a couple of guys did expert calls. Uh, we found out together that more or less this thing had the best, uh, the best uh, product in their market. For, for what it was. Still didn't know what the hell it was, but we talked to a Humana guy, or I, I didn't, my, my buddy talked to a Humana, uh, someone that worked at Humana, one of their customers. And he said, this is the best product out there. It's phenomenal. The, 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 just so everyone knows the uh, transcripts on Tegas so people can read it. Um, it turns out, basically, this is an $8 billion industry. And this took a really long time to figure out. So, and what they particularly do is the, the insurance company, or the, the, the company, Basically, audits claims paid by insurance company. So if you if you did knee surgery, if you got knee surgery, and you if someone messed up and they coded you something to do with the brain, for example, then and and the insurance company actually paid for it. They it just went through all their cracks. Performant would go in, and they would look at they every month they get all the claims from every single insurance or not every single every one of their clients insurance company clients. And they go and audit those claims and they say, okay, we have doctors and nurses on staff and these areas we've, we noticed at CMS, people were making these errors. So we're helping out Humana over here and we're, 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 we're helping Humana determine. And that's sort of the point of why they exist. The insurance companies themselves, I mean, the real industry is something like three, $300 billion, but performance going after with, with only three real competitors going after $8 billion of revenue out of that. So of, of revenue to them. Okay. So we found out that, that this was a business that, that had very, very little competition. And uh, I'm not taking a bleach credit for this. I, we, me and three other guys uh, worked on it together uh, for the most part. But I think I'm the most bullish on it. So that's why I'm, I'm on your uh, podcast talking about it. <laughs> so, so basically, the industry is more or less the historically CMS, Center of Medicare and Medicaid, they had these contracts with, uh, with 
these insurance companies. You need a license or the, these uh, these recovery companies, and you need a license actually doing. Only five people had a license. There was a lot of consolidation over time. Optum, uh, which is owned by United Healthcare, that, that, that was one of the companies. They they just bought Change Healthcare. I, I'm not sure if the deals actually go through, but it looks like that's going to go through. That's one. Then you have Veritas Capital, who owns HMS. HMS just got taken out by 17 times EV to EBITDA, and they were only growing four percent a year. And then they bought Cotivity, which is another one of the competitors, and they bought that. I think, at something like the same multiple. Cotivity at 35% EBITDA margins, HMS at 28% EBITDA margins. Okay. Then, then you had Discovery Health, which is owned by uh, Metaplan. Uh, I, f- I forget the ticker. It, it's, a, it's a $10 billion company. This, is, this acquisition was only $155 million. It's, you can't even find anything on it from the company. Uh, but you basically have four players in the entire industry of $8 billion in revenue. Performant had grown from their revenue 25 times in seven years, more or less. So so basically, you had the situation where it appeared that the barriers to entry were really high. And I had heard from a call and a couple other employees that they had a really good piece of technology and they had uh, and they were growing really quickly. And that's pretty much all I needed to know in the beginning, right? So, so I started sizing into the actual position. Then over the past maybe four or five months, I've just this has been my life. I've been just just trying to figure out what this business is. And more or less... The, the thesis is that this is an absolutely incredible business with unbelievably high barriers to entry on the commercial side. So they're, they're basically going to all these insurance companies and they're, the way the industry works is you, you, the, indus, the, uh, the, the insurance companies want to use you. Unlike a lot of other companies where they have to pay you to actually do it, the, this, this company is a very, very high quality business because what it does is it just saves money for the insurance companies. They basically go over and feed the claims and they get paid 15 to 25% of the claims that they get. And they, it's a profit center for the insurance companies. So if you don't sign on Performant, HMS, Cotivity, and Discovery might be other the other competitors that every every insurance company uses every uh, every uh, vendor. And, and if you don't use Performant, then Performant might be able to find these certain claims that none of the other companies have and so you're just missing out on revenue. So all these insurance companies, as long as you have a license from CMS, they'll they'll deal with you on the commercial side. They want to use every single one. So so in the beginning, it was very hard to get contracts, but now Performant has a very very good stream of growth. So so right now they're expecting eighty six point five million dollars in revenue this year. And the key here is what I was talking about earlier: how they have contractual. Uh, a good company might have contractual revenue that that it would appear in the in the future. So in in performance transcripts, they talk about how they start, they have new program starts. Well, each program start takes six to nine months to actually integrate into the insurance company, and then you don't see the revenue for another three to six months. And it could take longer than six to nine months at the beginning. So if you see them get a starting program, you know that the revenue is going to show up in eighteen months ish. Okay. So, so when you, when management's telling me that they're growing and these dynamics, all I have to do is sort of talk to people in the industry and just make sure they're not really bullshitting me because if they're, if they're telling the truth and the way the industry works is you don't, you can never, you you can obviously, but, but it's unlikely to lose an insurance company. What might happen is you might drop in the, in the, in the actual uh, tech stack. So perform might have the number one, uh, uh, a place in the tech stack, like the insurance companies might go first, then perform might get the first pass at every single one of the claims. And then after they're done and they, they submit their claims, then HMS might go. Then, then on day three, then Cotivity might go. So you could fall down in that stack, but when you enter into a new insurance company, you get the bottom pass, you get the fourth pass. So you really can grow, you only go up. So, because you're taking a look at the claims after all the other insurance companies, uh, the all the other recovery uh, vendors have uh, taken a look at them. So you could grow by getting new customers. You can get new verticals. There are 45 verticals per insurance company to be conservative, um, and you could grow by moving up in the tech stack. So, so there was there was clear growth coming from multiple different areas. Right? You were starting the the, the company was talking about how, or I was hearing from customers that it was a great product. Then the company was talking about how they were get, winning all these new programs. Their programs would show up in 18 months, the actual revenue. Then you, based on how you understood the industry, how the industry worked, you, you could move up in the tech stack. And because I kept hearing that it was a great product, it was likely that they were going to move from the number four position up to three, two, one. And that's natural growth. 
Okay. And then once you get into insurance company, you get into one insurance. Let's say you're getting into Edna. You're going to get one or two of the 45 verticals in Edna. And then it was clear over time that they were adding more and more like their largest customer, which I think is Humana. Uh, I'm not sure the company never told me that just to be clear, but I think it's Humana. Uh, they have 12 verticals, but they still have another 37 to, or what, what is, what's my math? Uh, 12. So 45, uh, they have another 33 to go. So there is natural growth within it. And there is a logical reason why. And you were buying this thing at two times EBITDA on the equity stuff. Okay. So, and then on top of that, it's in an $8 billion industry. So it was, and, and from what I heard, there was no reason why they couldn't get 40% uh, of the market over time. And from what the company was telling me and other people in the industry were telling me, they could get 40% EBITDA margins. Cotivity was getting 35% and uh, HMS was getting 28%. And on top of that, HMS just got taken out for 17 times EV to EBITDA. And this thing was trading at, well, at this point, the debt had come down. It was trading at four times EV to EBITDA, but on the equity stub, it was trading at two times. So number one, it was undervalued. It was growing at 65% a year. Number two, there were comps that were taking, like, getting taken out for ridiculous multiples growing at nothing. So, and then now the company is, it's, it's gone up a little bit. This was at a dollar-ish. Now the company's at 450. But, but still, you've got a scenario where a lot of people get very excited about all these different companies. Like there, there's one that people talk about, Power Technologies. Well, there's a little bit of friction there between the actual um, – the actual – what? Shareholder? No, I'm not a shareholder. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, I'm not, I'm not a shareholder. But there, there's a little friction there between the franchisees and, and Par. Par, from what I understand, has the best technology. But there's a little friction from what I understand between actually getting the – the franchisees to actually sign on and use their product because there's 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 pain to actually doing it. I, I I don't know the company perfectly, but but my point is that this company literally the insurance companies are begging them and their backlog is gigantic. They just need the manpower to actually roll out into more and more and integrate into more and more of these uh, in, insurance companies. A quick question on the eighty six point five million that they guided, they publicly announced that. Oh uh, yeah, they publicly announced that. It's the midpoint uh, eighty three to okay. ninety, and on top of that. In March, they sold the shitty business. They sold the student loans recovery business. So now this is a pure play. They're going to use the money from the student loans recovery business to pay pay off the debt. They're going to. I think they're going to get it to about twenty five million dollars in net debt by the end of this year. But this is why I'm looking at the equity versus just the entire enterprise value. And I know most people or a lot of people are going to. Uh, you're, I'm going to get some grief for saying that, but that's 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 how I look at these things. So, so in in a year, they're not going to have any debt anymore. And their biggest competitor, which they're kicking their ass, just got taken out at 17 times EBITDA, EBITDA, growing at 4%. Performance growing at, I don't know, 27% this year, but it's going to accelerate next year because during Q2 and Q3 of 2020, the um, uh, the insurance companies weren't allowing any of these vendors to come in and, and do anything because they were completely shut down during coronavirus. So now the revenues are going to start picking up because that's and that's evidenced by the the programs that they they're winning and you can read about them in their in their transcripts. The management saying in Q4 they won ten uh, programs and that was seven to nine million dollars in that range of incremental revenue. Then they won five new programs in Q1 and that that it's not it's not. 10 programs is or five programs is not necessarily half the revenue of 10. And they're, they're saying it's maybe around the same. I'm not sure exactly. And then you should see more and more over time. Q2 should be more contract wins. Q3 should be more contract wins. And this is all pushing revenue back. And on top of that, you have free options. Like I said, they, they deal with a CMS. There are other CMS regions in their, in their, uh, portfolio. They, they have two of the smaller contracts out of the five with CMS. There are two big contracts that are coming due over the next year. One, one's actually coming due next month. And I think they might be able to win. I think it could be a 25, 20 to $30 million contract in, incrementally, but that, that revenue would show up in 2023. And then you have another one that might be another 25 to $30 million. So there's just so much optionality everywhere. And you know that the revenues are actually, actually going to show up based on how the, the integration process actually works and the things undervalued like crazy. So. And, and Chris, I, I, but I, I do have to ask because that was, you know, thank you for that. Like that, that was a, a just to give some context, that was an example of how you found an idea at an event, exactly. you start talking with management and government. Yeah. So, and then, and then, you know, I, I, now that I've heard kind of the, the more or less the bull case, you know, what, what would you say is the downside risk then for, for this? And thing? honestly, I, I mean, there, there always is downside risk, but I mean, I, this is, this is good. I, I, I don't really know what the exact 
Humor me. Yeah, I mean, it, it could be an execution thing. They they could over time they they use doctors and, and doctors and nurses to identify the claims that are that the areas where the claims might be going wrong. And they the doctors and nurses talk to people at hospitals and they try to figure out where it's coming from. They could start really messing up on that. But if they start messing up on that, and from what I've heard from management, they're in the first or second pass on every single one of their verticals now within large insurance companies. They're about to roll out, a, they're talking about rolling out a SaaS product for lower level, uh, lower size insurance companies, which are 500,000 covered lives or less. That could, that could do bad. They, they, they're going after the mid-level insurance market where the large like HMS Cotivity, uh, Optum, all these guys, they don't go after the mid-level insurance uh, companies. So that's from 500,000 covered lives to 4 million covered lives. But that rollout could go poorly. And the growth really, it, 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 it's more to me, I think there's risk that it doesn't go up 100 times from here over the next 10 years. And there are things that could go lo- wrong along the way. I, I think at these prices, then because you kind of know what revenues are in the next couple of years, it, and it's hard. It's hard to see a scenario where you don't make money. And that's really the, the types of opportunities we like to find. We like to find companies that will stagnate. Maybe this thing goes down to three bucks or something like that over the next two years. If, if they don't execute, things go wrong, like in some way, it's, it's going to be an execution issue. But, but in reality, you're buying, it's a $250 million market cap. Their, their, their steady state EBITDA margins are 40%. They're doing close to ninety million dollars in revenue this year. I mean, there there are two sell side analysts that I think are very good that picked them up: Kyle from Colliers and George Sutton and uh, James Rush from uh, Craig Hallam. I think they're both really good. They think their their numbers are similar to what my numbers were: uh, one hundred twenty ish million dollars in revenue next year. They're run rating a lot higher right now than than it's showing. Um, people have thought that there was a charge off in Q one. So they 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 uh, they misre- or they they got paid on some um, some claims that they shouldn't have gotten paid on. And there was a three point three million dollar charge off on seventeen million dollars in revenue. So it looked like a big number, but that 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 stuff happens occasionally, from what I understand. So there could be certain things that could go wrong, but but in reality, I mean, if you think if you think maybe they can get thirty percent EBITDA margins instead of forty percent, the the uh, the analysts are saying thirty percent, but um, I think they could be much higher. Uh, performance talking about moving some of their labor potentially to um, to the Philippines. Uh, that could go wrong. I, I don't think that's a the doctors and nurses. You, you can have doctors and nurses in the Philippines basically identify the claims. You can't do it for CMS because it's illegal, but you can do it for the commercial insurance companies. That's fair game, and that's where Cotivity is very very good. Uh, that's why they have the higher margins. They have seven percent higher margins. But um, I mean, there, I have these documents in front of me from CMS that are talking about how uh, it, it, these talk about the different rack regions and performance is two times better in terms of their accuracy than than all their competitors. I heard from a couple people, ex employees from HMS, that performance uh, that that HMS is just completely oblivious to how good performance tech actually is. I heard it from customers. I just across the board, anecdotally, I've never seen the tech before. Um, I'm going to go down and visit the company. That's that's usually part of my process as well. But I mean, those things could go wrong. Tech could be garbage, and I could just not know because I'm not a I'm not a coder. Um, but th- that's that's where things could go wrong. Gotcha. Okay. Cool. All right. So I think we we wrapped the bow on on the performance uh, the story. You know, I think I think you covered that you covered that quite extensively. That was good. Um, yeah. So so you know, Chris, I, I'd love to going back to you know this idea of, of finding ideas and talking with management from doing all these events, you know, I've said this a thousand times now already today, yeah. but you know, for, to help those that might be maybe a little shy or don't, don't usually talk to management, but maybe probably should, you know, what, what are some of the, the qualitative clues that you get when you ask these management teams, the same questions over and over again, and, and, and maybe, you know, what some of those best questions are and, and maybe some of those, those those phrases that indicate some of those certain things that you're looking for. Well, I think I think you just got to ask important questions, right? So you over time you understand when someone's lying to you, uh, which is I think key. You just from interacting with people all the time, you you can sort of tell by the tone of their voice, like looking them in the eyes. You know what I mean? That's why I like in person meetings, whether or not they truly believe what they're saying. And then you ask the same questions five times, five different ways. And you can see them get visibly a little bit frustrated sometimes, but then you sort of get it out of them eventually. 
Um, so I think, I think what's key is, is you have to figure out in your head, you don't have to use Excel. Like most people think you need to use a big Excel spreadsheet because most pension funds won't give you money. Well, yeah, but uh, I'm not going to go there, but, uh, <laughs> but I think for uh, individual investors, what they can do is you got to build this like little model in your head. So you got to say, what are revenues now? What can revenues be in the future? What are EBITDA, uh, what's EBITDA now? What can EBITDA be in the future? What are EBITDA, mar- what's EBITDA margins in the future? What's, what's CapEx going to be? So the way I calculate free cash flow is I do EBITDA minus maintenance CapEx minus cash interest. So it's a pre-tax number. A lot of people do it in a lot of different ways. I find this way really good. Uh, where, where you can go wrong is you ask what maintenance CapEx is, is for management and they give you some kind of bad number. They, they give you, they, 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 like if you talk to an auto company, then they're not going to give you a straight maintenance CapEx number. But I like to include, for example, if they need to have a new model to survive, then to me, that's that's sustaining. You need that CapEx to keep going. So I include that in my maintenance CapEx number. So you have to go into detail on all these different things. Why can they increase EBITDA margin? A lot of people, a lot of the easiest situations um, are companies where they're cutting costs. They're, they're actually cutting costs. Like there's this company that um, I don't own anymore. I, I do not own anymore, but I've owned in the past called Volt. And uh, it, it's a staffing company. And they were doing all their bills by paper in the back office. And they were talking about how they were going to cut out $150 million, I think it was, in, in uh, expenses. Th- those, are, those are actually situations that can really, really work. You, you just have to... You have to be uh, you have to be careful. So you 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 can't you can't get suckered into believing that someone's going to win some contract. A lot of those things are binary situations. Look what happened to Workhorse. I don't own Workhorse. But they ended up not winning their um, their uh, post office. I, I don't I don't believe they won. They didn't win their post office. Uh, but the stock worked. I mean, I looked at that thing at fifty cents. I feel like an idiot for not buying it. But but I mean I I mean I it, they didn't win. So I guess I can't like beat myself up too much. But uh, I think Equity was doing a deal for them, and actually they they didn't actually do it. Uh, but and I don't own that one either. Uh, or I'm not I'm not involved in that security. At all. Yeah, you, um, you got you. You got you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, you, you got to just. I I think the key to really doing I think well in the market is you really have to work hard and you have to do volume and you have to keep looking at company after company after company and so, and after a while things just click and yeah. if you're not willing to work hard there are other people out there that will work harder than you that you will have a disadvantage and you also have to look at the right types of companies a lot of people will look at things and say they're like a 20 IRR or 20% IRR or 25% IRR well you could be wrong about a lot of the things I like to buy invest in situations where even if I'm wrong about, about something, I can still make money. I mean, I have to be right that the company's not going to go bankrupt. And that is sometimes hard to figure out. And you know what, if the situation's too hard, if there isn't, but, but the easy, the way you make that easier is as long as there's, if you can analyze one part of the company that's really growing, that really should be good in a couple of years, you're generally in a good area because what that happens is that people start focusing on that and then stock starts going up. And then they can, if, if something bad happens, they can raise money at a higher level. But it, you need some portion of the business that people can get excited about. Like, like there, there are securities that we've owned in the past. Like I, I owned, I, I've gone after things like private prisons before. Uh, the Core Civic was trading at uh, two times EBITDA or one and a half times EBITDA. And they, uh, I, I own it. Um, and uh, uh Actually, no, I, I don't own it anymore, but I've owned it and I'm, I, may, I may be a buyer soon. Uh, uh, but, but that company, I mean, a lot of the stuff I look at is political risk. And, and sometimes with political risk, you have no idea what the hell is going to happen. And that those are risky situations. You just have to size it properly. I, but but I, I don't mind going big, but I, I go big in things where there's not going to be some huge blinds. Like with, with Core Civic. I mean, yeah, it's cheap. It's a real estate company that leases. Well, they're changing their business model from uh, le- uh, from operating, building and operating prisons to leasing prisons to the federal government. I mean, what other real estate companies out there that are trading that traded two times EBITDA that are that, that their counterparty is or their their tenant is the federal government? I mean, it's insane. It's not politically nice, but I mean, if they're just a construction company and they're leasing out to uh, to to the federal government, I, I don't really see a problem with that. Um, if the federal government's buying the building from them, you know what I mean? So, uh, but 
so really it just comes from experience and i just suggest everyone to go to your conference and and just go and meet with as many companies as possible and just don't care if you look stupid i mean i'm sure i looked stupid at some of your first events and when i didn't know <laughs> what questions to ask but i just really focus in on what what does the company do and what are the numbers going to be and you could really get an edge there because a lot of people will say this is a really high quality business i'm going to pay up for this and a lot of people are really good financial analysts, but they're not good business analysts. And a lot of people, where people make mistakes are they pick what they think is a good business, they pay too much for it, and it's wrong. If you are really good and you pick a good quality business, not necessarily the highest quality business, at a very, very cheap price, you usually can make money that way. Very good. All right, so my last question when it comes to you know doing hundreds of, of, uh, of, of these meetings and one-on-ones at, at the events, and uh, what's, what's the goofiest thing or the goofiest, maybe not idea, but just the goofiest overall meeting that you sat in on. You're like, wow, that was, that's an experience. I'm going to put that one in my book uh, 20 years from now. You no, know, I had a guy tell me uh, the other day, he was a public company CEO. I'm not going to say his name. Yeah. Or, let's not say the name. Yeah. yeah. He told me he was the greatest <laughs> fucking investor in the world. <laughs> what? <laughs> he told me he was the greatest fucking investor in the world. And, and he, he, because I didn't read his annual letter and he was like yelling at me. It, it was literally for 15 minutes. He was screaming at me because I didn't read the 70 page letter. And I was, I was dumbfounded. Like I, I just have never been in a situation like that before where, yeah, I mean, the stock wasn't that cheap. I, I, I thought, I think it's an interesting company. I think it's a very good business, but I, I wanted to know more. And I, I know the, I know the story pretty well. But I just didn't read the letter. I read previous letters, but I didn't read his. I didn't even notice that he had a new letter. And boy, that was, that was that's, that's something that happens. I mean, I've probably done five thousand meetings, and that was the first one that's ever happened to me. And um, but uh, but yeah, that that was probably the goofiest. That was the strangest. <laughs> and that's <laughs> recently. <laughs> that was re- yeah, yeah. So that's that's what funny. A, what a I'll tell you the goofiest situation. <laughs> this, this is actually interesting. There's this company going public right now, and it's back. And this is the other story. This is really interesting, actually. This company okay. called NSP Recovery. It's going business. I don't own shares. Uh, the ticker's what, L- what, was the name? what was the name again? Sorry. MSP Recovery. It's okay. merging into a SPAC. Uh, MSP, so Performan has this MSP. It's called Medicare Select Program. I, I think I think it's a very small portion of uh, performance revenues. So I, I was looking into it. And uh, my buddy actually called me about this because it was one of the guys that uh, owns Performan. And we were looking at it. And so this company has zero revenues and it's going public at a $32.6 billion valuation. And I believe there's 28 million shares outstanding. There's a clause that if you don't redeem your shares, they're giving, they're issuing 1.09 billion covered warrants. So the, the CEO of the, of the, uh, the company that's, that's merging is basically selling you his shares in form of a warrant. He's giving you the right to buy their, his shares over five years. And they're issuing 1.09 billion warrants, uh, 0029 billion warrants to the aggregate of the 28 million shareholders that are not redeeming. So you, you get a minimum of 35 warrants per share, if, if I understand this correctly. And I, I, I believe I do. Um, uh, but yeah, that, that's like one of the goofiest situations I've ever seen. There's definitely a, a way to make money there. I don't know how if it's long or short or whatever. I don't know if, how you could short that, but uh, maybe there's some way to make money there. But that's the goofiest situation I've ever seen. That's and, and, you, and, you don't, and you don't own shares? I do not own shares. I'm not involved in any situation. I reserve the right to, to buy or sell of any of these companies in the future. <laughs> You're on it today with disclaimers, man. I love it. Um, <laughs> my compliance is going to be very happy. Uh, all, right. <laughs> all right. So, you know, we're rounding the bend today with, with uh, today's, today's interview. And I, like I said, we could probably talk for hours about all this stuff and going in all sorts of directions on goofy stories and weird stuff. But, you know, what, what would you say is an investing experience that changed your career or just changed your perspective the most thus far? Ooh, I mean, I think, I, th- I think it's honestly doing all these meetings. I mean, five years ago when I started doing this, six years ago, I was a little bit shy and I didn't want to talk to management teams because I thought I would look stupid. And then, like I said, uh, a couple of my buddies like pushed me to start doing it. And then I started doing it cr- crazy amounts. And I mean, th- th- I wouldn't trade that for the world. I mean, your conferences are so helpful to me. Uh, you don't even understand. I bought so many things from your conferences that 
that it's it's just but but I suggest people to look at every single company at these conferences and take a meeting with every single one of them and be genuine. It makes you genuinely interested in what they do as well in terms of, because there's so many different ways to make money in this. But, but I think, I think to answer your question, it's, it's, I think the most important thing that's been the most important thing for my career is doing meetings after meetings, after meetings, after meetings. That was, that's, that's an experience that, that really trains you to be pretty good over time. I think not that I'm good, but, but I, I think, I think that it's, it, there's a possibility that you could be really good over time. Absolutely. And, and thank you for those kind words, man. You know, we do our best to put together the best events that we possibly can and, and showcase as many different ideas from all areas of the market. So I, and it, and so anybody listening that maybe might be a little gun shy about going and doing some just of these one-on-ones, like, yeah, just, just do it. it. It's a half an hour. It's a half an hour each of your time. If you look a little stupid, I say you look a little stupid. I look stupid on a daily basis <laughs> doing some of these I'm podcast not, interviews. Thanks. You know, I, yeah. <laughs> It, it, it's, it's fun looking stupid you, sometimes. You uh, <laughs> yeah, you just have to do it. You have to just, you have to practice. You can't, you can't learn how to sort of learn how to get the right information out of management teams, the important information without just doing it over and over again. After a hundred times, you're going to be fine. Yep. So. Couldn't agree more. Don't yeah. worry. I'm going to social, I'm going to social clip this, this part of the, uh, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's for sure. Very good. So, all right. So, so with that, you know, um, before I let you go, what advice do you have then for first timers interviewing management other than just going and doing it and don't be afraid to feel stupid? You know, uh, maybe you have like, uh, you've already suggested a couple questions. I mean, is there anything else, you know, maybe that a couple first timers so that they, they feel, all right, I feel a little bit better about, it. you know, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to go request a couple one-on-ones. Let's I would say be optimistic with every meeting. Don't go in trying to harass management and telling them that they're committing a fraud or they're doing something and like, they're, they're like, Oh, how do you do that? Blah, blah, blah. Like, or, or think you're the smartest person in the room. I mean, a lot of, I think a lot of people go in and they think they understand businesses, but when you talk to someone that really understands a business, they've been doing it for 50 years or 35 years, they understand the business better than you do. And if you go in optimistic about every single company and not go in, like I used to short sometimes, honestly, I don't even like shorting anymore. I don't even like the mindset because it, it just, you, you try to pick out what's wrong. You have to, there's a book called the most important thing uh, by Howard Marks. And it's, it's important because you have to invest in, you have to figure out what are the most important things to me. I think the most important thing is buying something cheap. If I could buy a apartment for a million dollars and I can rent it out at a market rent of $500,000 a year, and I can use leverage on that apartment. So I'm making, let's say, let's say I put 20% down and I'm making 150% of my money every single year. I think that's a pretty good investment. And that's what you want to look for in the public markets as well. You want to look for the best investments, but you can't find the best investments without looking at really bad investments as well. And also mediocre things in the middle or semi-good investments. You want to find those tens to really find. And, and you know what? There, there are a ton of them. I mean, everyone has companies that go up 10x. You just have to, but you have to, you have to look at a ton of things. So I would go in optimistic to the meetings, be genuinely interested. You, you, you ask, don't be hostile. Don't like say, don't say mean things to management or, or try to get into an argument about it. Just, just try to learn what they know. And then if you do that over and over again, then I think it works. Very good. All right, Chris, with that, where can my audience go and find more information uh, on Chatham Harbor, follow you on social media and, and the, the whole bit? Yeah, yeah. It's CHCAP, so CHCAP 2016, um, and that's my Twitter handle, so they can, they can find me there. Or uh, they can email me at krug at chathamharborcapital.com, and the website is chathamharborcapital.com, but it's not very good, so... <laughs> Well, Chris, dude, this was great. I really enjoyed our chat today. I'm sure you'll come back at some point, either on the round table or another one. And uh, yeah, man, I really enjoyed it today. So uh, with that, good luck, stay safe. And soon we'll be in person soon. Yeah, I hope so. I'll tell us. All right, man. Thanks. Bye. All right. Talk to you. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network, SNN Inc., and the Planet Microcap Podcast and the representatives are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy and sell securities in any company mentioned and may profit in the event those securities rise in value. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast. Podcast.